Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Merle Massey. I am the coordinator of the Undergraduate Research Initiative at the University of Saskatchewan. One of the things that's happening in the larger Canadian research um, um, milieu, I guess, is that the tri agencies are asking researchers who uh, receive funding from uh, NSERC, SHRC, and CIHR uh, to start creating research data management plans. And so we kind of wanted to roll back from that and is like, how, how do you manage research data? What does that look like? When you engage in research and you start collecting things, what are some of the best tips and practices to actually get a handle on that research data? So we have asked our University of Saskatchewan uh, Associate Librarian in Health Sciences, Kevin Reed, who is a guru in this area. He has been taking the lead at USASC in this. And with that, Kevin is going to talk you through how to manage your research data. Over to you. Thank you, Merle. So hi, everyone, and thank you for coming and for your interest in research data management today. The, the goals of this session are to help you become familiar with what research data management is, how it fits into the research life cycle. So over the course of starting a project to finishing it, what that looks like, to help convince you that managing your data is worth the effort, uh, to outline what is involved in doing so and where to begin, and then to also provide you with some resources to where you can go for help or to learn more after this session, because I can cover some of the beginning points of this, but within an hour, it's there's a lot more that you can cover. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge here that we have students on this call, we have faculty, we have undergraduate and graduate students and postdocs. And so when we're thinking about research data management, context is really important. So this session is going to give you an idea of some of the things that I think and that I have seen work really well in helping you manage research data as you work through a project. But some of these are going to be contextual. And so they may be more valuable or less valuable depending on the area of research that you work in. So just to start and lay some common ground, I wanna just make sure we're all on the same page with what do I mean when I say research data management? And so research data management in this context is any information that you might collect, generate, or use to validate your research findings. So when I'm talking about research data, that's what I refer to. Basically, it's any data that you are using as the basis for conclusions or arguments um, in a published paper, in a conference presentation, in a preprint, for example. That's what the type of research data we're talking about. Another idea and a bonus part of research data is any information others might need to know or to use to understand your data, which we would call documentation. So documentation that would help someone come to your data for the first time and actually understand what you did, how you did it, and what that data is. Also, if you have questions at any point throughout the session, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll try to stop at different sections to make sure to answer them. And we're a relatively small group right now, so we can also have a bit of discussion if we need to. So when we're thinking about different types of data, I like to separate them out into the two most common ways that we might think about data from a research perspective. One being quantitative data, so everything from geographic coordinates to measures of the environment or signal recordings, uh, to qualitative data, which might be free text responses in a survey, oral histories, papers or documents. And so having a good understanding of these two might help you think about what kinds of documentation or what kind of data management you might be wanting to do when working with these types of data. We also can think about data in terms of primary and secondary. So primary being data that's been collected firsthand, it's original. So that might be everything from data you collected observing migratory bird patterns in Argentina or clinical trial data on the efficacy and safety of a drug. Whereas secondary data is collected by someone else. So it may have already been collected and analyzed and shared, and it can essentially be reused for new projects. So some very obvious examples of secondary data might be census data from Statistics Canada, or you borrowing or using a data set that someone else was published by another researcher. So primary data is yours, original and unique. Secondary data is available for reuse, for reinterpretation, and new research. And then we also want to think about data by stage. So 
we think about data in really three component parts, one being raw data. So data as it exists at the point of collection. And usually this is unaltered, but it can also be used as secondary data. So your raw data might be someone else's as well. Process data means that it's data that's transformed or manipulated in some way and prepared for analysis. And this is where it can include information about personal identifying information. Usually that might be removed in this case. And then finally, analyzed data is data that has gone through some type of analysis. So it's often dependent on a piece of software that you might have used to run an analysis. And this is commonly what you would see reported in a publication. So when we think about data management across these three stages, really you wanna think about what is the data that might be most valuable for someone to see if I was to publish my results or if I was to give a presentation. At what stage is my data most useful to somebody else at this point? So when we think about research data, research data management is really the planning, maintenance, and documentation of all aspects of your data during a study or a research project. If you are actively practicing data management, it should be helping you organize and keep track of your data, actually be able to use and understand your data, and preserve and share your data for the long term. So how many of you have gone back even five days or 10 days to a file that you had created and not remembered what it was or what it is, and really having to think back and scrounge as to what, it, what it's used for? And so what data management is designed to do here is to make sure that all of your data is easily understandable and documented well. So this is one version of what we call the research life cycle. And these take many forms. And if you were to Google research life cycle, you would find many different variations of this. But I happen to like this because what it does is it focuses on really the key elements of research and how data management comes into play. So when we think about the final output of our research, often the publication is the final thing. And so if we compare that to an iceberg, the publication is really the tip of that iceberg, right? And all of the other elements that might come into our research lie below the surface and unavailable. And so what data management is trying to do is open up all of those other components to make sure that those are available to help make that publication more fulsome and more robust so that we can actually reuse other research and you as the individual researcher can get credit for that work. So why should you bother with research data management? Why, why is this important? Well, as Merle mentioned, it is now a requirement. So the tri-agency has released a research data management policy, which is asking researchers who submit for grant funding, whether you're a humanities researcher or you're an engineering or you're working in medicine, that you would need to provide a data management plan. And we know that already there are pilot programs underway in all three of the agencies indicating and trialing what these data management plans will look like. So we're going to talk a lot today about what makes up a data management plan and how that might work. We also know that publishers are now expecting you to share your data in addition to your publication. So just the publication itself is no longer enough. So PLOS, for example, is one of the first examples of a journal that said, if you don't share your data with us, we will reject your article outright. It doesn't no matter how, much, how good your research is, you need to show proof that you've shared your data and your data needs to be understandable. And without good data management, your data cannot be reused or repurposed in any way. We also know that there's a reproducibility problem. So reproducibility, for those of you who aren't familiar with the concept, is the ability to follow or implement the same experiments using the same data and tools to get the same results. So I should be able to read your paper, follow the same methodology, use the same instruments or the same tools or the same approach, and ultimately get the same results. But what we found is that a lot of studies that have been looking at reproducibility more broadly have found that major studies that led to new treatments, that led to new drugs, could not actually be recreated. And the main reason was because of a lack of transparency, there was poor documentation, and reporting was incomplete. So people couldn't actually replicate anything because there wasn't sufficient information to do so. We also know that data management can prevent errors. So some of you have, may have heard of Retraction Watch before. And Retraction Watch is a place where uh, they highlight why certain papers are retracted. And most of the time when you go to that blog, 
you'll see there's a lot of bad actors. So people manipulating images or falsifying data, but sometimes you're, you'll come across something like this where we have a geneticist who when they were a graduate student published four papers, but ultimately later on they had to retract it and they had to because they found errors in the process. They couldn't actually locate the raw data that was used to make their figures. And the main reason why was generally poor data management and lab organization. So you don't wanna be in a situation where you're having papers retracted as the worst case scenario, just because you've done some poor data management in that process. So we also know that studies have shown that as soon as data or an article is published, the data underlying that publication loses value almost immediately. So in this chart, you'll see over a number of years, how available or useful data was by researchers actually reach, reaching out to authors, asking for data or trying to reuse data. And the main reason again, is because people stop taking care of it. As soon as it's published, it's not given the same attention and because of it, it degrades over time. So what you want to avoid, what data management is trying to do is avoid a scenario where you finish a project, you publish a paper, or you're, you, you present at a conference, and this is what's left, right? The chaos that you've left behind without thinking potentially about how you're going to organize that information and how you're going to make sure it's useful not only for you, but for others in the future. So I have this really obvious example here, or this sort of silly example of a recipe for heavenly pie by someone named Mrs. R.D. Sikafus. And so when we look at this particular recipe, we can see that it's a recipe for a pie, but what are some of the issues that you might see with this recipe? Um, just looking at it and reviewing it. What are some of the challenges you might see? If anyone's willing to share in the chat. If you were to highlight some concerns you might have with this recipe, what might one or two be? I think it doesn't give the details about the process, it just gives the detail about the, <laughs> the recipe. Exactly. So here we have a very, if I was to take this very literally, I would take two ripe bananas as a whole and throw them into a shell. I would take egg whites and do the same. Do I whip it? Do I chop anything? Am I putting it in a blender? Do I bake it? I don't know. And so when we think about heavenly pie in this context, I want you to think of, of the pie, the finished product as the published article, whereas the methods and the data are this poorly described recipe. And so when we think about this from a data management perspective, what we're finding here is that we have poorly described methods and unclear data. So even though a publication might have incredible method section that is very detailed, you're still not getting the whole picture of that process. And that's what data management is trying to accomplish here. So when we think about data management at that life cycle stage, at the hypothesis planning stage, we're developing a question, we're outlining a hypothesis, we're designing our study, we're drafting a protocol. Maybe we're coming up with our methodology here and creating a plan. We're then collecting the data, we're trying to organize it, we're documenting it and we're storing it. And then we're prepping data for analysis, we're analyzing it, we may be using certain types of software to do that. We may be creating our own code and then finally, we're publishing it. So we're generating figures for our publications, or we're compiling it all to write a final summary, or we're presenting on it. And so documentation and RDM is really designed here to keep track of all of that so that when you publish all of this other information is clear and transparent to others. So What's important to think about here is that your data can be of use to others. So this is a rubric that was created by a colleague of mine at Stanford named John Borgi. And what it does is it highlights the various categories that people fall into when they're doing their own research. So you can see here on the left-hand side, we have ad hoc and one-time approaches to data management. So ad hoc might be, when it comes to my data, I always have a way of doing things but I don't really have a standard or a documented plan for doing so. Whereas one time it might be, oh, someone asked me for my data, so I did a little bit more work, but I don't generally refer back to it. Whereas, so most people fall into these categories when they're not thinking about data management broadly. And that makes sense because it's not something maybe you've thought about before in this way. 
But the goal is to get everybody into the active and informative or, or optimized for reuse. So I'm actually thinking about a plan about all my research and I have an idea of what I'm going to do with it and how I'm going to document it. So this is where we're trying to get people to go. And this is what the tri-agency, for example, is really expecting of us to have some kind of idea of all the data that we have and making sure that we actually know what it is and we're being transparent about that process. So I, I just wanna take a little self-assessment activity. I know we have faculty on the call and we have undergraduates and we have graduate students, but what I'd like you to do is review each column for a minute and identify the description that best fits with your current practices. So maybe you're not doing research yet, but you are working on assignments or group work and where do you see yourself fitting in to these categories? And if you're feeling brave, you're welcome to share where you currently feel that you fit in the chat as we work through this. So in the, just for the next minute, think about what category you, you would put yourself in. And if you're feeling brave, enter that into the chat. Just give everybody about half a minute. And I will say when I first started, I was probably a one-time approach to this, whereas now I feel like I'm optimized for use and I, I better be if I'm teaching this class, absolutely. Okay. So if you're feeling brave, you can enter it now. If not, I'm going to move on. Okay. Thanks, Merle. All right. So what does data management look like in practice? And what I want to do today is go over some of the key components of what data management looks like and how it can really help you get a picture of your research and how to make sure that it's going to be more organized going forward. So the first thing is creating a data inventory. A data inventory is a really simple approach to get a lay of the land on all of the different types of information you might be creating and the tools you might be using to do so. So what a data inventory is, is it really asks your, forces you to ask yourself, what are the types of data am I actually collecting? What are the file types I'm generating from this kind of data? How stable is the data in its original form? So what that means is, am I updating data all the time? Is it something that I, I collect once and I never touch again? Um, how often is my data being changed or transformed? How much data am I going to be generating? This is a tough question. We may think we have an idea of this, and sometimes this might not be relevant for you. If you know your data is small, you don't need to worry about it because you can save it in OneDrive. However, if you're collecting petabytes or of data, you need to have a plan for where that data is going to be stored. And then finally, the last question is what other information would be necessary for someone to understand my data, including myself. So that might be your study protocol. It might be templates that you've used. It could be surveys or questionnaires. If you're working in a lab, it could be your lab notebook. And then also if you're working more on programmatic things, is it a certain kind of software? what types of dependencies you need. So are you working in a certain operating system? All of these things should be considered when you're thinking about your data inventory. So here is an example of the types of things you might enter in if you were creating a data inventory. So types of data, sensor recordings, transcripts, and surveys. There's the file types I have. I'm not modifying the data after it's been collected. And some of the examples of additional documentation that I have. So scripts from SPSS files that I'm using, which is statistical software, and then my questionnaire and a data use guide. So just to give you a sense of this, this is a great first start when you're first starting the project to say, okay, what, is the, what are all the outputs I'm creating over the course of a project? So from there, we move on to documentation. So 
once you have an idea of your inventory, if the last section of your page, so information necessary to understand the data is a little bit sparse here, this is where documentation comes into play. So when we think about documenting our data, there's a few questions we want to ask ourselves. Key considerations for you are, will my data make sense to somebody else? Will someone else understand how I collected that data? Does it reveal anything about who it was collected from? And can I ethically and legally share this data? So one of the first things, again, is describe in more detail, where is your data coming from? How are you collecting it? Are you, is your data coming from human beings or participants? Is it coming from the environment? Is it coming from a certain program or a center that you're working with that's outputting data? You wanna think about what are you measuring, testing or examining and what software programs or tools are you using? So one of the greatest ways to provide a really easy depiction or documentation of your work project is to build a data collection plan. So this could be done in writing or as a visualization, but really what this does is give you a sense and give anybody else a sense who might actually acquire or ask for the data or give the tri-agency an idea of what you're doing about the step-by-step -step process that your data goes through at, before it gets analyzed or before you work with it. So it's just a great way to depict that process from start to finish. You also wanna think about if you're working with tabular data, is your data understandable to somebody else? So here we have an example of a data set from a researcher that I actually used to work with when I worked at NYU. And he let me share this for the purposes of showing what not to do when creating a spreadsheet, for example. So if I was to give this to you, you would have no idea what P1 or P2 means or one or zeros or the threes mean or active or inactive. And so when we're deciding and building any data or collecting data that fits into a spreadsheet form, we wanna make sure that it's going to be useful to other people and that people can actually understand all the values within it and the variable names and what they mean. And so when you document your data, you want to define everything that, that you're measuring and assessing. You wanna list your variables and provide definitions of what they mean. How are they represented? Are they text? Are they a scale? Are they a number? And finally, and probably the most important, are what are the units of measure for specific variables? I've worked with people in the past who it was a UK-US collaboration and, and weight was being collected in stones and in pounds. And so when the data came in at the end, they had to spend a lot of time transferring data into the right formats. So again, think about the process of what are you communicating to others and, and what types of units are you actually using to collect your data? And so one way that's really easy to do this is called the data dictionary. So a data dictionary can actually just be another sheet in your spreadsheet. And what it does is it lists the variables, it describes how values are represented and it provides the unit of measure for each one. So here in the image, you can see the variable names on the left-hand side and their definitions, the type of their data, the, and then the values associated with it. So a really simple step for making your research more understandable to others if you're working in tabular data. Another thing you can do is create readme files. So readme files can be very short or they can be very long. I have seen some that are a single page and others that are multiple pages that are a full data use guide for a research project. So Ideally, what you want to do is create one readme file for each data file that you create and write in some documentation that would help people understand what the data is about, how it was collected, information about how it was generated, so what tools that you use, and who is involved, so who's responsible for this. So again, one of the huge parts about data management is accountability. So as we think about when we're creating a certain project or we're working with certain data, and you have graduate students that you're working on projects or you're working with faculty, who is responsible for that data so that if someone leaves, you know to account for that and keep track of who has access. So another really important facet there, but readme files are a simple way to provide additional context to make your data more understandable as you go. Okay, I'm just gonna take a pause here for a second and see if anybody has any questions at this point.
So Kevin, I have just a quick question. So is this relates to the new IP or patent laws in place right now? Because there's a lot of buzz about it um, in the research um, uh, community. And I'm not a researcher myself. I, I am also University of Saskatchewan employee uh, and I'm a project manager there. Mm -hmm. uh, but just as an interest, is this uh, somehow, because I see you're, you're doing, this is great actually, whatever you're sharing. And actually it directly points to not only protection of data, but also the research per se. Yes. So as far as I know, the data management plans that are released by the Trade Agency are not tied to the new IP laws here. But in what you're describing, absolutely, in the sense that what we're trying to do here is create documentation and other research outputs can also be a value that way. So in terms of patents right now, no, but I think it doesn't mean that it couldn't apply to that context as well. But as far as I know that that I don't have any connection with that, or I have not heard of any, but that's a good question. And I've written that down to investigate that further. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. So now we come to a really, really obvious and, and simple part of the research process that I would say represent 80% of the challenges that I've seen researchers face as they work through certain projects. And that's just general file organization. And so when we think about file organization, it's just before you start a project, how are you going to keep track of everything, where it's going to live? If you have raw data that you're getting from another location and being transferred to you, and then you're manipulating it, how do you keep track of all of that? And so the general rule of thumb is that you have one directory per project that you work on, if that's possible. And you keep your data isolated to one place, you keep your methodology somewhere else, and then you focus on your manuscript. Again, everything here is contextual. So this might not necessarily work for you, but you want to avoid having many, many file directories for the same project. You want to try to keep everything as contained as possible. So you want to separate out folders for raw data or process data to keep track of where that data is living so it doesn't get mixed up and you don't lose data accidentally. You also, at the tri agency, is expecting that you have some type of file naming plan so that we know that you're creating data in the same way that it's going to be easy for you to find your files and to know what the contents is within them. So File naming, again, this most simple thing in the entire world, but I think the biggest challenge I've seen, people go back even a week later and have no idea what a file means or how to gain access to it. Maybe that resonates with you. But here we have an example of a file name with a date. So if we were to look at this date, it could be potentially interpreted in many different ways. So is it June 12th, 2011, December 6th, January 26th? And so what you want to think about is how are you going to standardize the information that you collect in any project? So one of the best rule of thumbs for dates, for example, is to use the year, month, day um, naming convention. So that's an ISO standard for how dates should be represented. And that way they can never be misinterpreted by doing that. Similarly, you want to be as descriptive as you can possibly be. File.txt is not going to help you figure out or find information within it, whereas a file with a date and a description of what's in it is going to make it much more readable for me as a human being to be able to find it and access it. You also want to be consistent. So if you're uploading data into a program, you want to make sure that those files are being uploaded in the right way. So the more consistency you can create, the more machine readable it's going to be. I also want to avoid abbreviations and try to avoid using spaces. So the general rule is dashes, underscores, letters or numbers, and that is it. So the more spaces or special characters you put in is going to be more challenging. And if you try to create abbreviations, it's going to be very hard for you to understand it later on or for anybody else to, for that matter. You also want to avoid special characters, as I mentioned. So any types of characters that you see here could be misinterpreted or broken if you transfer them over to a different file. I had this example with a colleague who um, had a and sign in their file name in Dropbox and overnight it created 20,000 files of the same file and overloaded the system. And so just by doing something unknowingly created a huge headache for them in terms of the data they created. 
And then finally, you also want to think about extensibility or version control. So if you know you're going to be creating 100 files, you want to think about extensibility. So on the right-hand side here, we have the 001, 002, because that's going to help it sort. Whereas if I was to not do that, you'll notice that if I was to upload this into a system, it's going to put number 10 second. And I've heard from many people that this is a huge error when they go to analyze the data because it's not in proper order. So just some really simple tips for keeping those file names consistent and extensible. Okay. So at this point, we have an inventory. So we have a full picture of what our data looks like. We have an idea of some of the ways we can document it. And we have a file organization system. Now it comes to where is that data going to live? And how are we going to make sure that that data is preserved for the long run? So when we're thinking about storing and preserving our data, the thing you want to think about is document where your data is going to live throughout the project. If it's only going to be in OneDrive, you don't have to worry about this stage. But if your data is coming from one location and being transferred onto your hard drive, then you're putting it onto a laptop or a graduate student has access to it or an undergrad has access to it, you want to keep track about who has access and where they have access to it. Plan out what that process looks like ahead of time and consider who is responsible for that data at different stages. So again, you might have be working with a statistician who needs to look at that data. When do they access it? What programs are they using? This is again going to help you get a good picture of what the types of research is being stored and where. So think about that at every stage, whether it's the beginning stage to the last stage, where is your data living at every part of this project across the life cycle? Also really important to think about, just because you store something somewhere does not mean that you're preserving it. So if I have all my data on a USB drive in a single box in my house, that is not preservation, right? Because there's only one copy of it. It's in a format that could get stepped on or get lost very easily. And so preservation is a huge part of data management. And so when we think about preservation, what we're trying to do is protect our data from hardware obsolescence and software obsolescence. So on the left-hand side here, we have an example of a jazz drive with my colleague's PhD thesis on it. How many people have heard of a jazz drive before and realize that the actual hardware to open files using a jazz drive don't really exist anymore. So I would have to go to eBay, find a old jazz drive tool, hope it works to gain access to this data. On the right-hand side, I used a proprietary format in one of my previous research projects. And because of that, I can't find a program to open that file ever again, because I didn't think about transferring it to a more usable open format. So every time I open it, this is what I see. So preservation is here to help us avoid these errors and to think about the longevity and usefulness of our data. So some general rule of th rules of thumb is if you have certain types of file formats, whether it's Excel or Word, for example, these are proprietary formats and sure they've been here for a long time, but if you're ever working with spreadsheet data, for example, you could save it as a CSV file or a comma separated value file. And that can be opened on any program, whether it's Google Sheets or it's Excel, or it's another tool that um, from a Mac product, for example. So all these formats on the right are just ways that we can safeguard our data. So even though you might have many copies in Excel, at least have one copy as a CSV to make sure anybody can open it. And this is what preservation is all about long-term usability of our data. <clears throat> Again, think about that continued value for research over time. One of the key issues in this paper was that a lot of the data was created in niche formats that people couldn't use, which is why it declined in value over time. So the general rule of thumb is always protect your raw data. So the data that you're using to inform your analysis create at least one copy in a preservation format. And then you can make as many copies and subsets as you'd like, which will allow you to transform it and um, run analysis on it in any way that you need to. Also a really good idea is to follow the three, two, one rule. So 
Keep at least three copies of your data, store two backup copies on different devices or storage systems, and keep at least one backup copy offsite. So I used to work at NYU, and when I was at NYU is when Hurricane Sandy hit, and a lot of researchers, even though they had their laptop and a USB drive or a hard drive in their lab, all of that got washed away. And they lost years of data because of it, because their data wasn't at least backed up off site somewhere and they weren't using the university storage system, which automatically backs up data for us. So really good rules of thumb. I always keep three copies of my data. I know that USASC IT is already doing that for me with two copies, but I always have an extra one with me at home as well. Okay. I'm going to take a pause here and have some water. Is there any questions at this point? Okay. Actually, I do, Kevin. Sorry. Yes. Do you yeah. have any concerns about storing data in the cloud? It depends which cloud, right? So I think when you're, what's really important to look at is if you're planning to store valuable data in, for example, an Amazon web service or a Dropbox, for example, what are the policies they have around use and what type of protection is there for your data? So I would look at how often it's backed up, where it's backed up to make sure there's no risk of data loss. There were some huge articles out a few years ago about how Dropbox, a lot of researchers were using Dropbox for their data and it shorted out for about a week and people lost a ton of research that way. So what I normally recommend is trying to use, if your data again is, really valuable and it's the only thing that you have to rely upon to do your research to use ICT as much as you can because our own software programs here and our storage systems are backed up off-site. They're backed up multiple times throughout the week and that's a good protection system. But if you're working with Google, for example, which obviously everybody uses and that's fine, but just know that if anything ever goes down, it's a lot more of an issue there. So the other side of the cloud storage too is sensitivity, right? So you don't want to be storing any sensitive data in any place other than a USAS storage system. So I don't have an issue with cloud as long as you're comfortable with the risks of it and potentially also the idea that some cloud systems, if you're using a really niche one, for example, could go bankrupt or could shut down and what happens to your data then? So even if your data is stored in the cloud, maybe have another copy of it in another location. Thanks, Mo. <clears throat> okay, so moving on to the last couple of stages of this. And one of the parts of the tri-agency data management policy that's going to be coming at a later date is the deposit of data. So making sure that your data is deposited somewhere so it can be available for others if that's applicable. So for example, if your data doesn't have any privacy restrictions. And so when you're thinking about sharing your data, you have the publication that you share, but then you should also be sharing the underlying data and the methods if you can. And that's really what's becoming an expectation from journals as well as from the tri-agency. And so one of the ways that we can share data if we have interest in doing so is through a repository. So a repository is essentially a place that you can publicly share your data. And there are different variations of these repositories. There are institutional repositories, so ones hosted by different universities. We have a institutional repository at USAS called Harvest, but it does not accept data. There are also cross-disciplinary repositories, which are broad catch-alls for different disciplines that allow you to share data publicly. And then discipline-specific ones, so ones looking only at worm-based research, for example, or genetics research. And what's important to think about with these repositories is that each of them offer varying levels of preservation access and storage. So obviously all of them provide storage access, but only some will preserve your data and some will access data. So before you share anywhere, you want to make sure that you are comfortable with what that repository can do with your data going forward. And I see this as something in the chat. Thank you, Merle, for putting Harvest there. So one of the most common places that is becoming a storage location for sharing research data in Canada is the Federated Research Data Repository, which you'll have a link to here on these slides. 
And this repository is a way for Canadian researchers to share their data publicly. So you can deposit your data here, create a record for your data, and people can search for it and access it. It gets indexed in Google. So if people were searching for the data, it would create a citation for your data, and you could be given credit for that work in addition to your publication. If you weren't interested in sharing in a general purpose repository, which further is, so it's really cross-disciplinary. You can find research on every topic under the sun in further. But there is another tool called Read3Data, which will give you access to find specific discipline repositories. So if you're working in the humanities and you have some interesting raw data that you collected from the different papers that you were exploring, you could click on the humanities section of this wheel and it will give you access to all the places where people are sharing underlying documentation and methods for those research projects. So it's a great way if you're looking for a specific community in which to share that you look through read through data to see what's available to you. I also want to highlight that not all data that you can that is available that you collect can be shared publicly. So again, those key considerations. Does the data I'm collecting reveal anything about who it was collected from? And can I ethically and legally share this data? These are questions you definitely want to ask yourself before you share. Because in a data management plan, if you cannot share because you are working with human subjects and they did not consent to having their data shared, you can simply write in, I cannot share this data. So we want to think about before you check, before you share is, are you permitted to share your data publicly? If there are restrictions placed, what conditions would someone need to meet the use of the data? And so some of those examples might be ethics approval, they might need a data request application or data use agreement. And all of these things would need to be filled out before someone could get access to that data. And ultimately, because of that, you could not share that data publicly. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so also, very important to note that the context in which you work is going to impact how your data is shared and how it's communicated to the public. So working with Indigenous communities, for example, they have a number of different levels of governance and approaches to how data should and could be shared and really focuses on community approval. And you'll see this in a lot of different communities. So when you're communicating in documentation about how data could be accessed, these are the types of things that you wanna to use to inform the actual sharing process or the lack of sharing process because of these restrictions that are in place. So if you can share your data, make it usable. There was an article that came out a little while ago in the New England Journal of Medicine that talked about data dumpsters and how even though we're requiring people to share now, they're just sharing that example of a spreadsheet that I showed you earlier, which essentially is useless to somebody else. And so if you're going to share, make sure that you're sharing the data that you've collected, the instruments that you use to collect the data or the methods, for example, the documentation you have, and any software and tools you used. Just doing these few things are going to give people a much better picture of your research and your data that you cannot capture in a publication or you don't have time to explain in a presentation. So it's essentially that additional context that you can use to do so. Okay. So when we think about data management and data sharing, the idea here is that all of that material is scooped together with the publication and the data goes into a repository that you can link to through to your publication. Okay, so the last step in this process, you've created a data inventory. You have a full landscape of what it is you have. You have an idea of how you can document your research so it's better understood. It's all organized in a file system. You know where your data is going to live and you have made steps to preserve it. And you've made decisions on where and how you can share. All of this now gets taken up and put into a data management plan. So a data management plan is really describing how you're going to manage that data across the life cycle. So it's that single document that guides how you're going to produce all that additional documentation during the process. 
and it's designed to make your data understandable to yourself and to other people. So we're taking all of those stages that we just talked about over the course of this session and we're folding it into that plan. So that's really what makes up the plan. And depending on your research area, it's going to depend on the types of things that you work with and the environments that you work in and the sensitivity of the data overall. So if you were interested in creating your own data management plan, for example, there are tools already available for you out there. The DMP Assistant is one of them. And what it is, is essentially a tool that allows you to build a data management plan by, ask, by responding to a series of questions exactly like what I showed you today over the course of the session. So if we were to look at the example um, here of what it looks like when I log into the DMP Assistant, which is a free tool, by the way, you can see here on the left-hand side, it's showing me questions about data collection, about documentation, about storage and preservation. And then when I click on it, it's going to give me the questions that I need to answer. So what documentation that is going to help the data be read and interpreted correctly. <clears throat> so it's just there to prompt you and you can export this and upload it to any grant application that you'd like as you go through the process. So other things you can do to, to learn more and find help. The university has a research guide specific to, to research data management right now that can take you to resources to help you think about how to build a file management plan and how to document your data accordingly. <clears throat> there are examples here. The third point is examples of completed data management plans that you could look at to see what a really robust, detailed data management plan looks like that's considered gold standard. There's also some really good best practices for managing data, how to create a data dictionary for those of you who are interested in that. And then I've included some of the OCAP training if you are working with Indigenous communities at any point in time through your research. We also have other supports on campus. So again, a lot of the questions around storage are going to go to research computing. So they're going to help you with the actual software services or data storage of your data and making sure that the sensitive data that you have, if you do, is being protected. And then there's also Chaser who can help you to support data collection, processing analysis, and statistics really for a fee. We also have, if you have further questions after this, you can always contact your librarian. Um, if you know who they are, you can look them up on the faculty list and contact them directly. And if not, you can find them by your subject area. So if you're working in chemistry or engineering or in the social sciences, you can see who's doing that type of support within the library itself. Kevin, we've been asked if we would uh, be okay with sharing a PDF version of your slides so that people can access those resources. Absolutely, 100%. Abs so Kevin's going to send it to me, and then uh, I will send it to everyone on the email list for today. Thanks, exactly. Tara, for asking. Perfect. And so that's really all I had for today. Data management, is the, the scope of it is so broad, but really, when it comes down to the actual process of doing it, it's just a matter of you providing a little more documentation about what you do and how you do it, when it comes to the data itself, so that you know that you feel comfortable, you could go back a year from now and look at your data and understand what you did and see the data really easily and have it be organized effectively. And so the same thing applies for as we see more movement towards data sharing and towards data management in the research sphere that we can accommodate requests from funders and from publishers to make sure that we're doing this um, for transparency's sake, for reproducibility's sake, and to make sure that publicly funded research is available and transparent as much as possible. So I'll end it there. I've left about 10 minutes for questions if people have them. I'm happy to stay on the call and, and answer any specific questions you may have. Um, but otherwise, I'll thank you for your time today. Um, and I hope that it will give you some incentive to think about how to improve data management going forward. So thanks so much. Kevin, that was fantastic, by the way. So thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, you know, I and I learned, I'm, 
I'm always uh, feeling like, oh, Merle, you knew better. Kevin told you about that, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, I forgot again. Um, but I, I, yeah, I will get better. And each time I, I go through this, I will get better. But I am curious. So with, with this push to kind of develop these data management plans and kind of share more of that publicly and, on, and online, mm -hmm. what do you think is going to happen in terms of there's always this sense in academia around, no, that data is mine. You know, I don't want someone else scooping my data, doing something with my data. Can you have it just a little conversation about that I know it's something that comes up absolutely and so I think the challenge here with that and it, it absolutely makes sense and I think it is still a sentiment I hear all the time but the hope is that by sharing your data you're and by sharing it in a public place like a repository for example that you get credit for that data so as soon as you were to share your data or that documentation in a repository it becomes an, another citation that someone would have to include should they use your data. So the challenge here obviously is that if you're competing with people for papers, and so the culture of data management, data sharing and publication more broadly has to come down to the fact that data citation has to be as equivalently important as citations to your published article. And I'll admit right now that it's not there. So if you release data and people go on to create amazing work out of that data that you didn't get a chance to do, should you get more credit for sharing your data that way because of the impact it had on the research sphere more broadly? Those types of, that type of nuance in credit for data and data citation isn't there yet. And so I, I, I think it's an understandable concern to be worried about sharing your data that way. So I, I, I think a lot of people will continue to safeguard that until we see tenure and promotion, hiring committees, and grant bodies saying, hey, look at the impact that your data had on the research sphere more broadly, and you deserve credit for doing that too. So I think it's a really great question. There's not necessarily a, a tidy answer for that yet. Thank you for addressing it. Carol has a question in the chat on managing data. Should we create a standard note on formatting just in case the format changes over time? So I'm, I'm, I'm curious about standard, so a standard note in what way, Carol, if you're willing to, to elaborate a little bit. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Carol, and ask the question. Okay. Um, so formatting change, if you change your formatting for images, documents, that kind of thing, you're in silent mode, <laughs> not a problem. Okay. Um, so, What's what's really helpful? I'm not sure if I'm going to get to the question because I, I, I'm I'm going to try to interpret what you mean by this. So when you're thinking about standard formats for your data, generally, I think the idea of what a data management plan does, in addition to help you make your research organized for the time being, is it also sets a standard template for how you can do research in the future. So if you do this once it should become easier to follow a data management plan and follow the same type of rules that you create going forward. So whether it's the type of ways that you, you know you're always going to be exporting files or documents in a certain way. And so you can keep track of that and say, okay, I know they're going to be in this format, so I'll keep track of that format for now. But if I need to change that later on, I need to indicate that. So if I'm pulling my data from a specific software program, and it comes out in this one file type and I have to transform it to a different image type or something, I would document that in my plan. And then hopefully when I go to do my next project, if I'm using the same type of source, that documentation is already there. And so it should keep track of notations of all the different steps that you might take in doing that. So I'm not sure, Carol, if that answers your question. I was wondering if, if just to add to that, I know that one of the things that I do sometimes with my data is that they're embedded within Excel and R and Stata is, it, is there is an ability to generate visuals. However, sometimes they're limited and they're kind of ugly. And so sometimes people will export their data into sort of prettier sorts of things um, to, to kind of uh, generate that. And I think that that's a good thing to make sure that you capture your data management and plan as well as what programs you used to generate your figures, your images, your, your, yes. yeah. And, and so on top of that, if you're using software like R or Python, one of the most important things you can do is actually comment in your code. So what are you doing before you do it? So before you run an analysis 
of anything right in above that what it is so you can actually share that and export it so someone can see oh here are the runs they did or here's how they analyze that data so documenting when you're running analysis is just as important as the process that you might take to export data and to move it from one place to another and to collect data going forward and just to add one more step is that that process of, of um, data management isn't something that only happens once. It happens throughout the whole life of the project, right? You know, so so as as you're generating data and you're and you're doing things to your data and visualizing it and you know taking a lot, and then you might change the experiment a little bit or do those sorts of things. Uh, and so you kind of need to document that as well. Or if you've looked in a different place or or decided to come at it from a slightly different direction, um, your data management plan allows you space to make sure that you're documenting uh, all of that as well. Absolutely. So a lot of people refer to the data management plan as a living document, right? So it changes, it adapts over time. And for any faculty on the call, one of the biggest challenges that a lot of people have is graduate students coming in and out of a research team. They get hired for a summer or for a year, and then they move on. But what a data management plan essentially does is give them an onboarding role sheet to say, here's what you're going to be doing, here's where the data is coming from. And so rather than you have to necessarily fully retrain someone or keep track of what that person did over the course of the, their time in the project, the data management plan should essentially, if you follow the steps from this presentation, keep track of what they did specifically and what their role was and how the data was documented throughout the process. Exactly. It's like, like a, a blueprint. blueprint. Exactly. Kevin ran uh, a really successful summer program with undergraduate students this past summer um, who were working with faculty right across the university in all kinds of disciplines. Uh, and the, the students did a data management plan as part of their summer research project. Kevin, do you want to talk about that a little bit just to yeah, say so, what the feedback has been? Yeah, so overall, the idea around this right was to, to train faculty and students in practicing data management for the first time. So building a plan at the very beginning of a summer project for the purposes of making sure that all of that was tracked. And so the, the best feedback I've received from that is that faculty have been able to get a full indication of what their students were doing for the whole summer, what data they were using, what files they were using, what programs they were using, and they worked together to do that. So it essentially created more clarity not only for the faculty member in terms of what the student was working on, but for the student as well. It set very clear parameters for which they were working and they knew what they were accountable for. And when they left the project, the data management plan just got tacked on to the outputs they created from their research for that summer and gave them that additional context. So the faculty had not only the research they did, but the plan that they used to create that all in one place. So it was a really valuable piece of, of, of the puzzle, I think, for that project was that most faculty got a better picture of their research overall. Exactly, Karen, like a standard operating procedure, but for data. That's exactly right. So and then their student gets an exact idea of what they need to be doing and what they're responsible for at the very beginning of the process. So SOP, for any of you who aren't familiar with what Karen put in the chat, is a standard operating procedure. So literally the steps you would take to from beginning to end on how to do and accomplish a specific task. In this case, a data management plan is essentially a standard operating procedure for your data. It's a great way to put it. One of the other things about those research data management plans, and this is just anecdotal that faculty have stopped me in the hallway to let me know, is that they, um, having the students complete it for their own research project actually set some pretty good groundwork for professors to expand it to sort of include that for their entire lab and or to have you know other people uh, also come up with similar ones and kind of amalgamate them up so definitely changing the research culture right across the campus so really great job on that kevin thank you yeah and it's just like again the idea of context is important here so i may have covered things today that you're like oh that's not really relevant for me and that's fine a data management plan has to work for you in your context. And so if you're working in a humanities context, you might not need to go into the same level of detail, but you do need to keep track of what are some of the original documents you're creating and where are you finding them? And how are you working with them to synthesize them into that final paper? That's really what Shirk is looking for, right? Is the idea of how we're stretching out the process from the very outset 
to the point where we're ready to publish that paper. So data management plan is really there to take you step by step and to help handhold you through that process. Okay. Well, I think with that, Kevin, um, we're going to say thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. You're going to send me a PDF copy of this. I will send it around to all of you who registered and uh, we have recorded it. And so and I'll also send the link once that's uploaded so that if you want to watch it again um, and and get Kevin's side side notes and insights, I think that that's well worth your time. If you want to share it with other people in your research group um, or other people across campus or in your departments or in your colleges that you think also need to hear this message, uh, by all means do so. Yes, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Merle, for inviting me. <laughs>